How are we all? Should be really well fed and watered. Yeah, good, good, good. Listen, first of all, thank you very much for coming down tonight, folks. It's, it's greatly appreciated. It's good to see so many of you here. Um, for those who, who don't know me, uh, my name is Ross Moffat, and I represent a company called Fleet Financial. Fleet Financial began 21 years ago as a micro enterprise, just like the companies that you're going to hear about this evening. Flash forward 21 years, and we are now one of the largest contract hire and vehicle management companies in the UK. We have over 1,300 clients, and we manage over 5,000 vehicles in the year. Um, at the beginning of 2017, encouraged by my friends, family, and Fleet Financial, I also co-founded a social enterprise called Pop Up. Pop Up is an original musical showcase where, where collectively we are trying to elevate Northern Ireland's music scene back up to its dizzy heights where it once was. Um, a pop up could be anywhere near as successful as Fleet Financial, or I'll be very, very happy. Uh, and shared workspaces such as this venue, the normal bass, make my goals and aspirations much, much easier by providing a space and, and an environment where to work, co share, and share ideas. So, welcome to the Ormo Bass, um, home of Belfast's latest and most successful micro enterprises. Tonight is about networking. Tonight is about listening to our guest speakers on stage who are at the very top of their profession. Not only will they be talking about how they do what they do, but they'll be talking about why they do what they do, which is much more important, um, and what it is that fuels and fuels their energy. Just a few house rules, and um, we're not expecting a fire drill this evening, so if you hear the fire alarm ring, run. Um, the fire exits are there and one at the back. Um, there will be comfort breaks, but should you need the, the, the facilities, they're just down the steps and, and, and to the left-hand side. So enjoy the evening and feel free to share this live on your social media platforms. We're going to be operating and using the hashtag uh, MM3 on Twitter. So there'll be a small, a short question and answer session at the end of the evening. Feel free, if you're too shy to ask in person, feel free to tweet your questions and, and Joe at the back of the room will be able to pick those up and, and wait our way through those. So feel free to do that. Um, so on to our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is actually the brainchild behind this evening. He believes so much in the power of networking, so much in the power of positivity, and so much in the power of working together to create a, a, a better um, build. He thought it was important to bring like-minded people across and to work together and to engage with one another to work towards each other. I've never actually met Martin and found him to be in a, in a foul mood, so it's not just an act that I thought initially it was. Um, my, my first meeting with Martin was at a, a network event not too dissimilar to this um, over in East Belfast, where I was instantly drawn to his warmth and his willingness to help. Throughout 2017, Martin has been a great help for me in both my roles in Pop-Up and in Fleet Financial. I found that I've been able to lean on him and ask him for advice, and he's given me that advice with uh, transparency and integrity, and he does it all without complaint. His accountancy firm with his wife Michelle Gil, Kristen Coe have become a household name in Belfast and I'm proud to call them friends and I'm proud to be invited here tonight to do this with them. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Martin Gilchrist. I think I'm in the wrong Martin Gilchrist. I'm not sure who he's talking about, <laughs> but that was wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Ross. Um, guys, I'm going to just get straight to it. Tonight I'm here to talk about Branding. Branding is a story. It's a story of your business, what you do, and why you do it, and who you do it for. And uh, the thing about branding is, do you know what? You can brand with a website, you can brand with promotional material, and you can brand by handing out business cards. But if um, people don't know you, and they um, don't need what you have right there and then, they're not going to care about your brand. Nobody's going to care. So what I'm suggesting is that if you want to develop a brand as a small business, you have to find a meaningful way to connect with your network. Don't just brand yourself, but brand yourself as part of a network. And the reason for that is, you guys will listen to me tonight for about 20 25 minutes and then there will be another speaker after <coughs> me and another speaker after that and by the time you get home tomorrow at night you'll have forgotten what I said but what you won't forget is the impression that 
have made on you. And at the end of the day, brand is what other people say about you when you're not there. What do you say about me when I'm not there? If you don't care, you're not going to say anything at all. So I'm going to look at five ways in which we have branded Gilchrist and Co. over the years. Five ways. And the first thing we did was we started something. We started the social media association for business. And that's a big long name that pretty much does what it says on the tin. The difficulty with that big long name is if you put a .com at the end and try to use it as a web address, it's a very long web address to type in. And if you have to use it as an email address and type somebody's name into email, it's just too long. So being creative and innovative people at the Social Media Association for Business, we abbreviated that name. And when you abbreviate Social Media Association for Business, you get SMAB. <laughs> SMAB. Now, I get it, and you get it. SMAB, by the way, somebody made hundreds of these for us. <laughs> there's, there's thousands of pictures all over the internet with this on it, but um, um, with, that, with that abbreviation and with that brand, we were incredibly successful. So within a couple of months of forming the Social Media Association for Business, which was a voluntary organization, we had the full use of um, the lecture hall in the University of Ulster, Belfast City Centre campus, for free. We had a steering committee. We had 2,000 people join our group. We had speakers and sponsors queuing up to support us. And you guys are probably sitting there thinking, well, What's that got to do with small business branding for Gilchrist & Co? And it would be a good question because not once at any of those events did we ever stand up at the podium and talk about Gilchrist & Co. We never put up a banner stand. I don't think we even so much as gave out business cards. But what we did do in that year that we worked with SMAB was that we won about £20,000 of new client work for the practice, directly from what we were doing in SMAP. And the way that worked is this. If you start something, you get the credibility. Credibility leads to conversations, and conversations lead to opportunities. So start something, that's the first thing. The difficulty about starting something is that it's incredibly hard. Most people won't start something because of the time and the energy and the effort involves. So the second thing we did at Gilchrist & Co. was we joined something. And we joined the business and the community network. So we were business and community mentors. I was elected to the steering committee of Digital Circle many years ago. And only just last night, Mary McKenna, who was the chair of Digital Circle, mentioned me in a, a LinkedIn post, which was very nice. Story. But what I would like to do in particular is talk about my time at Down Enterprise Park. Janice Symington, the manager of Down Enterprise Park, had come across me on a whole series of occasions doing whatever it is that I do. <laughs> um, I think Esther, you had described it a couple of weeks ago as gallivanting, and I think that's a lovely word, gallivanting. So Janice um, invited me to join the board of Down Enterprise Park, and I was delighted. Because I wanted to work with the board members, I wanted to engage with the tenants and the clients of the Enterprise Park. You know, I wanted to be part of that whole LA, LEA thing. So it was brilliant for me. And I got so engaged and was so passionate about my role as a director that when the existing chairman, a guy called um, John McGrillan, stepped down because he was taking up a role heading up Invest NI, or sorry, Tourism NI. When he stepped down, the board of the Enterprise Park elected me to be chairman. And I was delighted. 
I was looking forward to the gold chain of office and the chauffeur driven car that was going to swan me about. Unfortunately, you don't get those things. It's a voluntary position. <laughs> um, so I had to take the job anyway. Um, and as the, chair, as the chairman of the board, although I didn't get those nice things, I did get the authority and the resources to do the stuff that I wanted to do. Upgrade the broadband infrastructure. Um, set up co-working space and hot desking space in the park. Outreach to other businesses and organizations in the community, all that great stuff. But there is one thing in particular that sticks to mind, and that was the opportunity I was given when I was invited to a meeting of Down District Council. And you should see the chambers in Down District Council. It is like something out of the Starship Enterprise. It's all chrome and glass and buttons and screens. And the councillors sit around a big oval table. And there's a chair at the top, it's like a captain's chair. One side of the chair was Alistair Hamilton, head of Invest NI and his senior team. On the other side of that chair was my team from Down Enterprise Park. And in the middle of all that was me. And I was given half an hour to talk about what my team and I felt Invest NI should be doing to better support small businesses in Down District. How else could I have got that opportunity if I hadn't joined something, if I hadn't joined the board of Diamond Price Park? That's the second thing, join something. The third thing is find a space. Find a physical location where you can become part of the furniture, the face in that place. And the first place that Michelle and I found for Gilchrist & Co that was like that was called CORE. CORE was the first co-working space that I had ever come across in Belfast. It was set up by a young man, and he was in his early 20s at the time, called Andy McMillan. And it was literally across the road, in a building called the Marquis Building. It was a semi-derelict, industrial, Victorian red brick building. And there's big, heavy black doors, and you went through the black door, and you had to go the whole way up the spiral staircase. You hiked up to the third floor. And you arrived on this landing, lots of little doors off it, all little businesses, and you went to the end, big double doors you went through. And Andy's space was a room roughly about the size of this, a little bit smaller, and all he had done was painted the walls, put in tables, and connected up Wi-Fi. And he was renting out those desks for about £100 a month each. Now, clearly the space wasn't the value. The value to us at Gilchrist & Co was the people Genuine startup entrepreneurs who were passionate and engaged, and they created their own buzz and their own community, their own story. And we were there, eating the pizza, drinking the beer, helping with the funding applications, being part of the conversation. In fact, we ran a bus. We ran a bus from Core up to the Northwest. There was a tech conference on, and it was a brilliant day. We took about 60 people with us. Many didn't know us, but lots of people. And we got there, we all had a great day. The problem was, which I didn't know, there was a guy called Mark McGrath, Mark McGrathby, who was running the event, and he put on a free bar. See, trying to get those guys back in the bus. Oh, it, was, it, was, it was a different story. But we made friends, we made connections, and we made clients in that place, and those people are still friends, clients, and connections today. The second space is Farset Labs. Farset Labs is a hacker space over in the Weaver Court Industrial Estate. And way back then there's a guy who set up called um, Andrew Bolster. And I should say Andrew Bolster PhD because he's done very well now. But way back when Andrew was a student, he was an undergrad, and he invited me to a meeting in the parlour bar which is next door to Queen's Student Union. And there's a wee room out the back. And he was explaining to me they wanted to start a hacker space. And I was going, what's that? What are you talking about? What? And I couldn't understand how he was going to fund it. I couldn't understand who would go to it. I just didn't get what he was talking about. A couple of years later, Michelle and I had our fifth anniversary party in Andrew Bolster's hacker space, which is called Farset Labs. 
And that place is still going strong today and it is a brilliant resource for academics, for students, for engineers, software developers, people in, uh, interested in digital media. And it's, it's a, a, a credit country, but for us, it's been an opportunity to attend events, to host events, to get to know people and get to win clients. Um, the final space, and I think I have to mention it, is here. Ormo Baths Gallery, co-working space, and entrepreneurial campus, to give it its full name. And this is a completely different resource from those two things that we had talked about previously. Um, it's well resourced, it's very sleek, it has super fast Wi-Fi, it has media rooms, and I have been taking full advantage. I've been meeting people in the meeting rooms, I've been drinking coffee in the hot desking space, I've been um, doing 360 live broadcasts, I've been attending events, and now with my friends, we're hosting our own event. And you may be going, uh, are you not doing any work? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we are doing work. The work we're doing here is building connections, and in the short period of time that we've been here, since the middle of August, we have won four new clients directly from being in the space and the serendipity of just bumping into people and having conversations. For a practice the size of ours, that is incredible. So that's the third thing, find your space. The fourth thing is do stuff for other people without expecting anything in return. Find a way to be helpful without expectation of reciprocation. And that's dead easy. I'm not talking about giving away your services or giving away your products or even necessarily giving away your time. Find ways that you can be useful. And that's stuff like if somebody does a good job for you, mention them on Facebook or LinkedIn. Talk about them when you're out at events like this here. Attend their events. You know, just turn up and show your support because this is so important for businesses. And the more you do, the better that will be for you. And I'll give you just one example. Um, there's a young man here tonight called James Perry. And James is a fantastic accountant. Um, but he also owns his own business. It's an exam coaching business. And James had asked me if I would speak at his event. What is your motivation, it was called. And of course, I was delighted. I was felt honored that he would ask me. The credibility that James would have would rub off on me. And I absolutely volunteered, even though I don't particularly like public speaking, but I wanted to, to do that. Um, but just speaking wasn't enough. You know, it's, James had put his trust in me, so I helped with organizing the event, looking for venues and you know, inviting people along and looking at how the, the event should be <coughs> managed. And James's event was a brilliant success. So he packed out the room in the Harp Bar. The venue was supposed to be, the, the event was supposed to be from six until eight. And at half 10 that night, the place was still thumping. You know, people were engrossed in conversation. It was really great. And for Michelle and I, it was brilliant. We won a new client, which is always good. But as well as that, there was a young lady there called Susanna Hall. And Susanna was working with Fleet Financial. And Susanna recommended me to them. Fleet Financial then invited Michelle and I to the inaugural event of the Knowledge Network which, which was held in the George Best Suite of Windsor Park Stadium. And it was a pretty fancy event, you know, it was pretty good. And I got, I got to be one of the um, speakers of that. And at that event, and you're, these, these names are going to sound familiar, I met Ross Moffat and Kevin Young. Ross, Kevin, James, and lots of other people are here helping me today. I didn't expect it, but they're here. Seriously, guys, find a way to do for others. So you've done all the hard work, and I am coming to the end. Now, I see there's a countdown clock here, so I better get to the end. <laughs> um, you've started something. You've joined something. You've found a space, and 
you've gone out into the world being helpful to people. It's time to relax. <coughs> it's time, I would propose, to have a party. And what I mean by a party, I'm old now, I'm not probably thinking the party the way that these guys would mean it. What I mean by a party is bring together people that inspire you, that motivate you, that you like, that make you a better person, and just put them in a room. You don't have to preach to them. You don't have to sell them anything or tell them anything. Just get them together and the magic will happen by itself. And we did that down in Farset Labs. So for our fifth anniversary party, Michelle and I put on a, some food and we put out some wine. And that was it. I didn't get up and speak. Nobody was getting up and speaking. But stuff happened around us. So Andrew, the founder of Farset Labs, put a big grid up on the wall. They have a big blackboard wall. He put a big grid up on the wall. And as people were coming in, he would hand them a piece of chalk and he would say, write up who you are and what you do. There was another guy there that night. Um, he might become familiar to you because he's wandering around here tonight, called Neil Harrison. And I don't want to embarrass Neil, but Neil is one of the best photographers I know. But more importantly than that, he is a genuinely decent guy. And I've known him for many years, and he's always been the same. Great guy. And Neil turned up, without being asked, um, <coughs> with his camera, and took a series of professional event pictures, the like of which I could never have afforded. And we were able to connect those wonderful pictures of all the people that were there with the grid that was on the wall and share it across our social media profile. The difference that made was this. Essentially, that event was a branding event. It was telling the story of Gilchrist & Co. as being a connected, friendly, approachable, professional accountancy practice. If it just had been us and the people in the room, maybe 70 people would have heard about it. But because of the pictures in the grid and social media, maybe 3,000 people heard about that event. We got contacted by Fergal McCormick. Fergal McCormick, for you who don't know him, is the founder and principal of FPM Chartered Accountants, one of the largest independent chartered accountants practice in Northern Ireland, if not the whole of Ireland. Fergal invited Michelle and I down to his Belfast office to meet himself and his partners to find out why the Gilchrist & Co brand was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, were, how were you guys um, doing it? Um, there is something I have sort of forgotten. I know I have to ask you to hold on to your seats. Hold on to your seats and brace yourselves because I am going to tell you something now that is going to shock you to your socks. I am over the age of 40. <laughs> I know, moisturizer and courage in the morning and you too can look as young as I am. Well, I'm actually 43 years old, and when I was 40, I didn't have a party. I had a festival of 40. A week-long series of festivities to celebrate that wonderful number. We had a family party, we had a friends party, but one of the best things we did, and there's some of you here tonight that were at it, we had a night down in the Dark Horse. Well, it was an afternoon, we're old. Um, four until six, four until six in the darkness, we, we booked it out and we invited people to come. And being a sort of a Gilchrist and brandy thing, we didn't even put on food or drink. It was all about the middle of but there, you, could, you could have brought your own. And uh, so we, we put it on from four until six, but what we did do was we got a cake. Happy 40th birthday, Martin. And there was like a little car on top of the cake. And it was lovely. And you could have fed about 50 people with this wonderful cake. And Michelle put me in charge of the cake. And I went down early, big cake, and Bart carried it into place. And for safekeeping, I put it behind the bar. And the party went on. And at 7 o'clock, the, the staff came to me and said, Martin, you were supposed to be out at 6. Come on. They're basically putting this out. So everybody was out onto the alleyway. And it was still sunny. It was May. 
beautiful evening. Everybody was out drinking their pints, and uh, I was walking out the door and I went, Kick! <sighs> Michelle's going to kill me. What am I going to do? <laughs> went behind the bar and I thought, nobody has seen the cake. If I sneak out with this cake, it'll be fine. Nobody, nobody, um, nobody will get me. And I took the cake and I walked out. The alleyway was packed and there was a guy there called Brian Peelan. Brian Peelan from View Digital. And he's not an invested journalist, but he was that night. He's seen me. The most embarrassing picture I've ever had. But that same evening, something else happened that was wonderful. That was the antithesis of that. It was the opposite of that. Um, there was a guy there called Garth and Love from Fathom. And Fathom is an incredibly successful business. And Garth's an incredibly successful guy. He does a lot of this public speaking type stuff and he does it really, really well. And Garth said to me, Martin, you can't just leave without saying stuff to these guys. You have to stand up and say something. So he arranged everybody so that I could say my words, whatever, whatever they were going to be. And uh, I got up and said my piece. And someone in the crowd, uh, I think it might have been a guy called Thomas McVeigh, which he hasn't made it here time. Thomas said, um, you need to get a picture. And this is the thing. A picture says thousand words and this one did because Michelle was standing beside me and we simply turned around everybody was standing behind us the picture was taken and that picture was special because every single person in that room was known to me and every single person in that room was exceptional Lyra McKee and she was the only person to get a standing ovation at the TEDx talks there at Stormont recently Gar from Fathom Debbie Sims um, head of new media in, in BBC. You could go through every single person and they were all exceptional. That picture, every time I see it, makes me incredibly proud because what it says to me is that those people, those incredible people, were standing there behind us. Guys, have a party. I'm going to finish now. I just have one more thing that I want you to do for me. One thing to ask of you. Picture in your minds 100 people lined up in front of you. 100 people that you know. And ask the question how many of those people are self employed? Now, if we go by statistics, it's going to be about 20. And you know, that's a large number, 20. That means 80 aren't. So, out of every 100 people you know, only 20 are self employed. Ask a second question. How many of those self-employed will still be self-employed in five years? You're going to lose at least half. And the reason for that is that self-employment is tough. Many of you are self-employed. You know how tough it is. And if you're hanging in there after five years, you know what? You're doing a great job. But then you have to ask the question, because you're down to ten. How many of those self-employed people that are surviving in self-employed employment are actually CIS contract workers in the building industry or working under a, an, umbrella, an umbrella company contract in the tech industry or Uber drivers, whatever. Take them away and you're left with a nub of people. Not very many people at all that are genuinely self-employed and are genuinely surviving in them. So you've done all that, you've stripped away all those people, out of that hundred, people that you know, and you're left this snub, and now you have to ask the hardest question of all. How many of those people that you know that have struggled and tried and worked <laughs> and done the study to get this unemployment would actually be better off in employment? Better off with a salary, holiday pay, sick pay, maternity pay, pensions, the work being provided to them, not having to worry about credit control, an office to sit in, a company car, all that stuff that you get when you're, self or when you're an employee. Because if you're capable to be self-employed, you're gonna be a high-ranking employee. How many of those people would be better just going into employment? Once you've asked that final question, you're left with the people in this room. 
and the people in this room, the self-employed people in this room that are surviving, and not only surviving, but thriving, growing, succeeding, building a better lives for themselves and for their families and for their communities. I believe those people are our brightest and our best. I believe those people are heroes. And if you think that talk, that for me to finish my presentation on that is too much, I ask you, answer this one question to yourself. What would our economy and our society be like? What would it be like if all we had was large corporations and the public sector? Guys, if you know someone that's self-employed, look out for them. Speak up for them and stand together with them. Because if you don't, who else will? Thank you. That was terrific, Martin. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, so one to our second speaker of the evening. Um, and I haven't actually met Kyle until this evening, which seems bizarre since he's, he's from here. The reason why I haven't ever actually met Kyle is because he's a digital nomad. He takes his work on the move with him. And I don't mean just in a lovely shared space like the normal bats. I mean park benches in Thailand, coffee shops in Singapore, the beach in Bali, here, there and everywhere. Um, Kyle is, is not only just a lecturer in the Northern Regional College, but he's also CEO of Get Invited, uh, the online ticketing platform but also now a published author, who's a busy, busy man. So it's our pleasure to welcome to the stage, Mr. Karen Gollick. So Martin called me up about a month ago, and he said, Kyle, you're not normal. And I was like, Martin, I think I'm very normal. I don't know what you're talking about. And he says, no, I don't, mean it, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean, like, the way you run your business, the way you live your life is, very unusual, and I think it would be a very interesting if you came to Belfast um, and give a talk at this event. So I've come from Thailand a few days ago, not just for this event, but uh, um, to talk to you about my story. So tonight I'm going to tell my story as an entrepreneur, but I felt a bit get guilty about it being all about me. So I'm also going to talk about the importance of why you should tell your own story and how you can use storytelling to promote your personal brand or promote your business brand. So, whoops. so humans communicate with stories and I think it's very important that if you're trying to build a business, you're trying to promote yourself, that you have a compelling story that you can tell in order to make your brand interesting. And my story is, whenever I was a student, um, I was doing my master's, and uh, they started a company called Get Invited, which is an online event ticketing system, which everybody should have used to get a ticket for tonight, unless you sneaked in through the side door at the end. And I started this as a student with my co-founder, who was also a student. Um, we raised a quarter of a million pounds of investment, and then we started, once we finished uni, we started building this business. So. We got a semi-corporate office in Belfast. I started um, hanging around with the cool kids in San Francisco with Facebook and Square and Google. And everything was going extremely well. And we started to get some really big customers on board. This was the launch festival in San Francisco. Um, it was 13,000 people. It had speakers like Gary Vaynerchuk, Peter Thiel, uh, which hopefully some people in this room no, there was 13,000 people at this event. Everything was going extremely well for us. But then one day I ended up in hospital. Um, I ended up really, I was getting really stressed out um, trying to build this business and build the business in a particular way. It was very stressful dealing with investors and everything I had to deal with. So I was starting to vomit a lot. I had like really bad stomach pains. And then one day I just puked this like stream of black tar. Um, so I went to the hospital, and they said it's internal bleeding. Um, they like, hooked me up to all these machines and stuff. It was all very awful. Um, I'm okay now, like, but... Um, so when I was lying in this hospital bed that night, I was doing quite a bit of self-reflection. And I was thinking about my lifestyle, I was thinking about my business, I was thinking about, you know, what's the kind of business that I was trying to build and the way I was living my life? Was this 
have a positive uh, impact on my life, um, I came to the conclusion that no, um, it was not. So I started a bit of soul searching. Um, I got out of hospital and I booked a flight to Thailand. So I moved to Thailand for a month. Uh, they set up my office in Koh Samui, in my bungalow, um, by the pool. And I spent some time here thinking about what I really wanted in my life and what kind of lifestyle that I uh, wanted to live. It kind of became apparent to me that what I was doing wasn't really serving me that well. Um, you know, my mission at the time was like to spend the next 10, 15 years building this one business, but I, my, I'm a designer by trade, I'm quite a creative person, I put all these ideas, I like starting things, and my job had become creating spreadsheets, um, pitch decks and pitching, and doing stuff that I didn't really like doing. So I started to play around with uh, some other ideas. So I became vegan when I got out of hospital because that scared the hell out of me. Um, so I became one of these annoying health freaks. Um, I couldn't cook, so I learned to cook, and then I started a food blog, um, and then I built uh, an, oops, this is the wrong slide, I'll talk about this slide first. I started illustrating Little Bell, this thing called Little Belfast. Um, it's basically like this interactive Belfast, I'm going to make some prints with it. Um, I just started doing these fun projects for enjoyment and a bit of like uh, relax and restoration while I was I'd come out of hospital. Um, I started building this artificial intelligence. Um, so this was to help other vegans find places to eat. Um, so you can talk to her, you can ask her questions, and she'll um, answer them. She's a bit of an idiot, but um, she can't really, doesn't work too well. But it was just a bit of fun. And I was doing these projects. Sorry, the slides are jumping all over the place now. Um, I started doing all these projects just to try and find out what it is that I want to do. And from this, I realized that what I actually wanted to do was how rather than build like one big business and spend my life doing that, was just to build all these other little businesses and these stupid projects and things. Um, so I kind of figured out that what I actually liked doing was building lifestyle businesses rather than building big tech businesses. I came back to Belfast. Uh, actually, you know, I met this guy in Chiang Mai called Matt. So I was sitting in a co-working space in Chiang Mai, and this guy sits down beside me. And to look at him, I thought he was Thai or a local. And he was like, what about you, mate? And I was like, right? And he was like, where are you from? And I was like, I'm from Belfast. He was, oh, I'm from Ballyclare. And I was like, it's really strange. And this guy is like, Chiang Mai is a small city in northern Thailand. It was like extremely bizarre that this guy had sat down beside me. And I was like, well, what do you do? He was like, I work for a startup in Belfast, but I hated it. So I quit my job and I've just moved to Chiang Mai. I said, what are you doing? He's like, I don't know. I'm just going to travel around the world indefinitely. Uh, I'm going to start a business. And I was like, okay, that's pretty cool, I guess. And this kind of gave me this idea of, you know, traveling around the world a lot. But I kind of forgot about it. I came back to Belfast. And I started to, I tried to like broaden my horizons. I started all these wee um, silly projects, um, but they were kind of just side projects. It was like, how can I use these skills to help other people? So I joined the board of a charity called Tammy, which is a mental health awareness charity in Belfast. And they work with like kids in sort of lesser off areas and they like try and get kids to engage in communities. And I helped them build this app to track the kids' engagement in these activities and to measure their emotional resilience and how those activities were, were affecting their mental health so that community workers could figure out what problems were that they are, they could intervene and um, help these kids. And I got a lot out of doing this. I think it was good to give back, but I also, it was the first time I'd actually written any code or designed something for like a sizable um, project. And then from this, we started to get, we started to get other people wanting me to make stuff for them. So we decided we didn't get invited that we were gonna do some work and help other people. So we wanted to help people that had ideas and help them get from idea to a product in the market. So we started working with companies like um, Makematics, we'll work with them in a minute. This is another, like, it's like an educational platform for kids that teaches kids how to do cool things with tech, like how to make their plant tweet um, whenever it's thirsty. Um, so we take on like a couple of projects every year that we think are really cool and interesting. And then we help people get from idea to 
you know, a product in the market. We do all the design work for what, um, helping with the launch strategy and write the code. Um, I was starting to get a lot happier at this point because I was getting to work on other things. I was working on my existing business. I was helping other people. I was working on all these stupid projects like my AI that doesn't work. And, um, but I started to get feel like this was, this was quite easy. Um, how can I make this more challenging for myself? So I thought back to the conversation that I had with Matt in Chiang Mai, and I booked a flight to Thailand, a uh, one-way ticket in March. So I moved to Bangkok for three weeks, and then I moved to Chiang Mai, which is where I now live. So I have an apartment in Chiang Mai where I kind of use as my base for maybe four or five, six months of the year. And I decided that I was going to try and work on all these projects, work on these different businesses, while traveling around the world continuously. So I moved to Chiang Mai to start off with, and then I moved to Vietnam. Um, but I didn't really like Vietnam, because people weren't as friendly as Thailand. So I left Vietnam and moved to Bali. Um, so this is Ubud in Bali. Uh, I got this amazing office in Bali. This is the co-working space, and it has a swimming pool. I know the owner of Bass is pretty cool, but like, <laughs> this, was, this was really cool. It is swimming pool. Um, we had like a smoothie bowl bar, like a coffee bar, um, everything in this like amazing co-working space. And I know that you're probably quite jealous looking at some of these pictures, but it wasn't all good. Like, I had to deal with stuff like this. Um, like my house in Bali, my bedroom was inside, but my living room and kitchen was outside. There was no walls. And as you can imagine, Bali has quite a wild life scene. Um, most of it was in my house. So every day, I had to deal with these and like wild rabbit dogs and stuff. Uh, but apart from that, everything is great. Then I left Bali and moved to Kili Air in Indonesia, which is this tiny wee island. And it has no cars, no motorbikes. You can only get around by a horse and cart, or you can cycle. The whole island's like white sand beaches. It's like the most beautiful place I've been to. Um, really good sunsets as well. And then I moved from there to Tokyo in Japan. I just put all these pictures in just to annoy everyone, make everyone jealous. Um, I moved to Tokyo in Japan, and I stayed there for a while. And I, I actually did do some work as well. I wasn't just on a big long holiday. So I wrote a book when I was away because I thought my story of, you know, it started off building this tech business and then I thought what most entrepreneurs don't and pivoted into a lifestyle business and then did all these other things. I thought that would make a good story. So I wrote a book when I was away, I published the book. And then that's my kind of main story. But I, one thing I also want to put in here before I talk about the importance of storytelling is I like to create these little like stupid micro stories. So one of these is I really like the color orange. It's not political, I just think it's like a really nice <laughs> color. And over the years, I've, uh, I've kind of built this association with my brand that you know, the color orange and I always thought it was silly until one day I was given a talk at Brave Conference in Dublin a couple of years ago. And it turned out that one of the other speakers also liked orange. And she challenged me to an orange off on stage. And it turned into this whole like crazy story on Twitter. And I thought it was, that what I was doing was just silly. And then I realized how powerful it was to actually create these little um, silly stories. Um, she won. Um, I just wore like a black blazer and a, a white shirt. Um, but you know, I thought this was kind of cool that like just these wee stupid things um, could actually be quite powerful marketing tools. Um, so that's my holiday. Um, now I want to talk about you know how you know that, that's my story. So what how, what advice should you tell your own personal story and how can you do this and you know how will it impact your brand or your business? Um, whenever I think of business in general, or so in the West, in West Western part in San Francisco, I think of this, you know, the kind of cliche people in the suits. Sorry, Martin Wes. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you go to business events, I find that everyone's talking about the same thing. You know, it's government scandal or Brexit, or you know, they're asking like how's business, and everybody lies and says it's great when really it's, it's all going to hell. Um, and, you know, everyone's dressed the same, everyone talks about the same things, and then you go and follow someone on Twitter, and you know, they're just tweeting these articles and things that other people have created. And I think there's this problem that everyone's trying to fit into this like professional stereotype, 
they're all trying to dress the same, they're all trying to talk about the same things on Twitter, and they're all having the same conversations. And I think the problem with this is like brands are missing personality, a little bit of like quirkiness, and interesting stories. And I think when we think of brands, a lot of people think, and like you touched on this earlier, Martin, that if people think, right, I've got my logo, I've got my orange color scheme, I've got my Twitter handle, my business name, and my URL, that's my brand, you know, I'm a, I've got an established brand. But actually, these things here don't really matter, like nobody cares about this kind of stuff. It's what you put on Twitter, it's what you put on your website, what you put on your Facebook page is important. And what you're going to put on those is your story, not articles that other people um, have created. Um, so what your brand actually is, is your story, it's your personality, it's your reputation, it's the work that you do, um, and more importantly, it's like how pe the interactions that you have with people, and how people, how you make those people feel. It's so like, for my personal brand, um, you know, I want people to feel inspired, or I want people to think differently about things, whether that's watching all my YouTube videos, reading my blog, or my tweets, or coming to a talk, I want people to think differently about Oh, maybe I could travel around the world, maybe I could build my business, maybe I could start a business, or um, I just want people to think differently and feel positive and inspired. And this is like way more than just thinking about your, your name, your logo. Um, but this all comes through your, your story. And I think that it's not that, it's, I don't think the problem is that people are boring and they don't have a story. It's that there's this fear of maybe like merging your personal identity in with your um, professional identity. I, I used to be this person that was like, I was on Twitter sharing other people's articles and having those conversations at events and I was kind of scared that if I talked about my travel plans or the fact that I like orange or I drink Buckfast, um, that, you know, people would be like, people would go, oh, that's, that's awful, that's so unprofessional. Um, but ultimately I've actually found that by just being yourself, people find you more interesting. Like this year, um, I've talked a lot, like a lot of my personal branding stuff has included my travel plans and these experiences I've had and things that I've been doing that are not really in any way related to my business. But I find that people actually find it interesting. Um, like my engagement on the content that I put out is like way higher than when I was just tweeting other people's content and I made the effort to like, you know, tell my own story on social media. And the, the biggest challenge in this is like stop caring what everybody else thinks and just start you know, putting yourself out there. And yes, you're gonna like piss some people off or um, people aren't gonna agree with what you're doing, but actually most people will probably find it much more interesting um, if you start incorporating like the things that you do in your personal life and you know, talking about those and using those stories to promote your brand. Um, own your own weirdness. So you probably guessed by now that I'm a pretty weird guy. I like orange, I drink back fast. I don't have a home, I just travel around the world and make these crazy, stupid projects. Um, but it's like, it's like using all these like little weird things and quirks and things about you that um, are really interesting. I met Martin before I went away on my travels and we were having a coffee and he was like, not for me, I just I love Northern Ireland, I'm just like I would never leave. Um, but then he told me that he had bought this camper van and he was gonna like travel around Northern Ireland in this camper van and I was like, that's really, it's really like quirky and interesting and I seen him like putting something on Facebook. He was somewhere in Northern Ireland and he had like a wee pack of sandwiches and a laptop and he was he was working remotely um, in the camp. And I was like, that's really interesting. That's a much better social media post than you know tweeting an article about you know something that happened to government um, recently. It's just like these little quirks and things that you're doing in your personal life that can actually become really interesting, like marketing tools to promote your business. And if you're kind of new to all this, you just start off in business, or and you don't feel that like you have a story, you haven't done anything worth talking about, then create a vision for what you want to do. So let's say you're just starting off in business, you know, go make that your story and document your journey of you starting a project or building a business, because people will actually find that really interesting. I think that's much more interesting um, than listening to someone stand up here and say, you know, I've just done all this stuff and I've traveled around the world. It's much better seeing it um, unfold. And like to finish off, like the caveat here is being yourself is not um, an excuse to be offensive or unprofessional or disrespectful to people. If you want to like build all this stuff into your personal brand and tell stories, 
you've still got to be punctual and on time and courteous to people and polite um, and have all these other aspects of your brand. If you have a quite a, an abrasive personality, then maybe you don't want to build that into your um, professional brand. brand. And make sure you have like, the reputation, the credibility, and the work to back all of this up. I'm standing up here saying I drink buck fast and I travel around the world, and some people are probably going, he's a crazy vegan hippie that drinks buck fast in Thailand, I would never work with him, and that's okay. But I think, and hopefully by the fact that I can get up here and talk about this, you know, I have the work to back it up, I've built the businesses, I've got the experience, and I wouldn't be able to share all this unless I've done it. So it's important that you know you have the credibility, you have the work, you have a good reputation, you do good work, um, people like you, you don't piss people off in the process if you want to go and tell some really crazy personal story. And to finish off, just you know, don't be afraid to like, inject your personality into your business brand or your, your, your professional brand. And even if you're building a business, your personal brand is still really important. Like people want to deal with humans whenever they're getting in touch with your business. You don't want to deal with just like some faceless um, corporation. So don't be afraid to inject that personality into it. Like use all your quirks and weird stuff, whether you travel around the world or um, whether you have a little camper van and you work remotely in another island. They don't talk about all that stuff because that's really interesting. It's human, people can relate to it and they find it interesting. Like use social media to tell your story. You see just tweeting articles and things by other people. Like everybody else on the planet is doing that, nobody cares. If you just tweet stuff that you're doing and your thoughts and your story, people are going to find that interesting and it's unique because it's your story. And just be yourself. You know, humans want to connect with other humans. They don't want to connect with like a professional robot that's behaving in a certain way. Just don't be afraid to be like a little bit messy and talk about things that you're doing and just um, put yourself um, out there. And that's me. Thank you very much. Folks, thank you very much, Carl. That was very informative, very entertaining. Thank you very much for that. We have um, another guest speaker coming up to the stage now, and in this little village that we call Northern Ireland, you know, news travels fast, good and bad, and social circles cross over. The last two years, I've been hearing the name of Kevin Young and social, different social circles, and people who are trying to connect us together, but Darius just haven't worked, and until now. Um, which is great. Kevin's, la Kevin's left lasting positive impressions on everybody he's met throughout different stages of his career, which I'm sure he'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and he's now created his own new micro enterprise called InMind, with the ethos that he's here to empower you to live the life that you dream of. Uh, on top of his new venture, he's also heavily involved in charity work. Um, so listen, put your hands together and please welcome to the stage, Kevin. Hello. Good evening. Uh, I want to first of all thank uh, Martin and Michelle for inviting me here. And a lot of weeks back, uh, I'm probably going to be moving about quite a bit, so I hope that doesn't upset the camera. Uh, I don't need that either. Oh no, I do. I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. I do. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> Folks, I'm glad to know that uh, as uh, Kai was talking about, I probably don't fit the commercial stereotype. Uh, but I find that's an advantage, and I don't have a presentation to give you, so you'll probably find that that's an advantage as well. Uh, so what I want to do is just chat to you for a minute or two, and uh, when I was working with Martin uh, a lot of weeks back, uh, Martin asked me the question, or he just threw something out, he said, Kev, would you, would, you just, would you just stand up and tell everyone why we're here? And I thought, yeah, no bother, I'll just stand up and tell everyone why we're here. And I went home and I got a pen and I sat down and I thought, why are we here? Ooh. Got a bit heavy. It's like, why are we here? <laughs> That's heavy, you know. So it wasn't just why are we here. It was why are we here, and that got really, really heavy. So before we answer that very heavy question, I would just like to do a little exercise. I'd like you all up on your feet, please. You've been sitting down now for an hour. Uh, I would like you. I was so stressed out. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I would like you all to uh, find a partner, and preferably someone that uh, isn't the person that you came here with. So if you can find someone else, be it behind you or in front of you. Don't worry, you're not going to be doing anything too embarrassing. Just mix yourself a little bit there, please, please. 
and uh, we're number one playing another game. So everyone got themselves a partner? Everyone got themselves a partner? Yeah? Everyone paired up in the room? Ross, get yourself a partner, please. Everyone get yourself a partner. Uh, can you please decide who is partner A? Can I see hands up for partner A? Partner A? And hands up for partner B? Brilliant, the B's are going to go first. So, what I want you to do, and I like to call this exercise Mr. Shaky Hands. Alright? This is Mr. Shaky Hands, or Mrs. Shaky Hands, whatever it is. Uh, what I want you to do is take the hand of the person, your partner, as if you're shaking a hand. Please do that. Now, what I want you to do is not let go of that hand until I tell you to do so. Okay? You're going to keep a hold of that hand for uh, an uncomfortably long time. Listen up, guys, please. What I would like you to do, and remember, bees are going to go first. We're only going to do this for a minute or a minute and a half. I would like the bees to tell the A's seven awesome things about themselves. Seven awesome things. And what I would like to do this up, when you've done your seven awesome things, I would like you to compliment the person that's in front of you. So you're going to tell them seven things and a compliment. Uh, you have about 30 seconds to do that. Please tell them seven things and compliment them. Go ahead. stereotypical business person and I sat in a room of what I then learned to be lovely people but I sat down and anyone mind if I swear? <laughs> and I sat down at this table and I went fuck <laughs> I'm in the wrong room I'm not in the right room here but I'm here now so there's nothing else for it just look the part too this is the voice from my head look the part you know look smart to my business cards out uh, and then Martin spoke. <laughs> and it was amazing. And he just sparked something in me. And I thought, I like that guy. I want to talk to him. So from that networking event that I was invited to by Damien at the back from Fleet Financial, 
I then got to meet uh, Martin. I also met Rose. I have since met Joe and Martin's wife, Michelle. I now work with Kai and Andy down the back. Uh, Gavin here as well. Uh, so that was from one networking event eight weeks ago. We still haven't answered the question of why do we do it? Or why are we here? And it's been mentioned a few times already. And the answer is to connect or connection. And not just, uh, yeah, I like that. Or a like or a, you know, a, a request or a friend request or whatever you do on LinkedIn and Twitter. So we're here for flesh on flesh connection, for eyeball connection. That wasn't a dirty joke. <laughs> We're here for, for, for connection. And that's why I got you to do that little exercise, just to bring a bit of energy to the room, to warm us up, and to shake somebody's hand. And shaking somebody's hand for more than five seconds, but can become really uncomfortable. Like really, really uncomfortable. And then when you're at 30 seconds, it's like, fuck, this is gonna stop. Uh, and I wanted you to have eyeball connection, flesh on flesh connection. And it's not just about making a connection, it is about nurturing connections and, and growing connections uh, and uh, supporting people <laughs> and helping people. That's why I make connections. And I mean, Martin said it earlier about doing stuff for people just for the joy of doing it. And I completely agree, except one little addition I would make, Martin, is that I do it free of will and uh, free of mind to do it. The only thing I expect is a hope that at some point, when I need a bit of support, or I need some help, that somebody will stand up and help me or support me. Uh, so, what I'd like to do now is, Martin, would you come and stand beside me, please? Just here. Uh, Kai, would you come and stand beside Martin? to way back to the childhood. Through the childhood, young teens, through school, maybe university, jobs, family, setting up businesses, getting married, becoming their own boss, right up to last Christmas, then through the winter and through the summer, maybe you're on holidays, up until last month, October, November, last week, and today, and boom! Everyone in this room, their timeline needs right now. You have nothing in front of you. Nothing. Now, we all hope that when we go outside, our cars are there. <laughs> yeah? And when we go home, our homes are there. And when we go to work tomorrow, we'll do a bit of business and, and make some money and help some people out and time will move forward. And those are all hopes and dreams. None of it's real. Because it's not there yet. Every person that's in this room, their timeline ends right now. There is nothing in front of you. And all that I ask is that you consider this question. If you all just lean slightly forward and lean on your toes, that is you leaning into your future. All right? And what you can do, yeah, don't fall over. Yeah, support each other, support each other. Help each other out, help each other out. So a, a question to consider is would you like to lean forward and move into your future 
with the support of the connections that you're making in this room or not? That's the question. You make a connection, you nourish it, support it, and bring it into your future, or don't. Easy as that. I know which I'm choosing. I'm choosing the farmer. Folks, thank you very much. You know, grab your seat again. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. So, we're here to connect. That's why we're here. Now, as Ross said, uh, I also do some charity work. And as I lean forward into my future, my next charity work uh, is going to Belarus on the 1st of January this year. Next year. Uh, 1st of January 2018. And with 12 volunteers, we will visit as many of the 60 orphanages that we have a connection with as possible. There are up to 11,000 children in 60 orphanages. Uh, and what we do is bring Christmas. So we'll go and audit the orphanages. Uh, we will do what needs to be done there. Fix a water pump, fix their beds, fix their wardrobes, medicine, cleaning supplies, clothing, whatever. Uh, we will go and buy this stuff locally. Uh, the charity called IODP already has arrangements set up with people in Belarus, in Minsk. And interestingly, Belarus, uh, uh, IODP is a charity that works at as close to 0% admin as is humanly possible. The only thing the charity pays for is to be audited by an external accountant. And we're hoping to get an accountant to do that for free. <laughs> because the, the, the founder of the charity is a guy called Tom McInerney, who is an ex-business editor of the Irish Times, and his now PR company suck up any of the costs of the charity stamps, bits and bobs. When I go to Belarus on the 1st of January, I pay my own flight, I pay my own food, I pay my board, I pay my, uh, I was gonna say holiday insurance, that's the wrong word, uh, travel insurance. Uh, so any costs that, that I, uh, have I pay for myself, which is separate from the, the, the charity work that, that, that I'm doing and the money that I'm raising. Uh, so, yeah, we will just bring a shitload of cash and we will buy the stuff that we need locally. Uh, it's quite difficult to transfer money, their currency is soft, it's quite corrupt, etc. Et uh, so, when I talk about the power of connection, I want to show you a quick video. Uh, I met a guy and girl at, at, a, at an event that I was hosting, uh, uh, working at about eight weeks ago. The event was organized by Lisa Murphy here. Uh, it was an amazing event. The event was called Ignite Your Ultimate Power. And I was helping people get registered. And they come and register. And the job that, that, that I was doing was to split up groups of people. So you don't want people to be comfortable. You, know, you want to stress them outside the comfort zone. So I was splitting these people up into different <coughs> groups, you know. And a guy and a girl. Andy. So, a guy and a girl, I'll get Andy to throw the wee bit out for me now. Uh, a guy and a girl that I met were called Ian and Shauna. And uh, Ian and Shauna came and I, and I was trying to separate them into different colours. And Ian came back and he was very distressed. He was like, oh God, I don't want to can't be separated. You know, from, you know. And the guy was sweating and stuff. And I was really distressed. Uh, I've later learned that he was heavily dyslexic and any writing or reading, the guy, the guy couldn't write his own name uh, through dyslexia. Uh, this is him. And I said to him, Ian, it's absolutely fine. Whatever you need, I'll sort it for you today. If you need something, speak to me. If you need some help, speak to me. Whatever you need, I'm here to make your day awesome. So I met him for five minutes when I was registered registering him. Met him for five minutes at the end when he came to me and said, I had an awesome day and thank you very much for your help and thanks for keeping me in the same group as Shauna. 
Uh, I said, hey, it's no problem. It's cool. That's what we're here for. So we connected. I've since spoken to Shana uh, for a couple of hours, not much. And then I got home on Saturday night, I was out for a few drinks with my wife. Got home on Saturday night and had been sent uh, this message. And to me, this is connection in action. This is what making a connection does. And these guys sent me this video and I honestly can say, I'm a big man and I shed a couple of tears on Saturday night when these people sent me this video. Andy, would you run that video for me, please? Hi, I'm Shana. I'm Ian. And a couple of weeks ago we came to Ignite Your Ultimate Power with Stevie and the first person we met was the lovely Kevin Young. And Kevin was really nice to us, is that right? So tonight we had a raffle at our annual club do and we raised 215 pounds for all you school to Belarus. So good luck, Kevin. keep up the good work. Kevin, if you hadn't sent me the wee video what you did, if you had had to send me the wee spirit, I wouldn't be able to read it. And this is the reason why you asked me for five pounds and we've decided to give our ballot fund to you tonight, which is two hundred and fifty pounds. Good luck to you all out there. Good luck, keep up the good work. Bye. So that was uh Sean and Ian. Uh, and another one here, would you give them a round of applause? Just uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and to me that, that is that is connection in action, and that's me stepping forward and, and I didn't know those guys. In fact, when I met them, I didn't even know I was doing the charity thing. Uh, and just help them. They just needed help, and I, I was just able to give the help, and I gave it. And that's what I got in return. And I'm nearly choking up crying now watching that video again. So, uh, remember the question what are we here for? The answer is connection. And do you step forward into your future? With the support of the connections that you make tonight, and you know what? I'm not connected with everyone. That's fine. That's fine. But I would encourage you to take the support of the connections that you made tonight and nurture them and grow them and support people and help people. And who knows when it'll be your turn for a bit of help. Now, I'm sure you're all guessing or thinking, when is this guy going to ask us for money? <laughs> Yeah. So that time is now. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you for money. Well, I am. Fuck. I am going to raffle. I live in Sainfield. Don't know if anyone knows what that is. So it's not far from here. This bottle of gin is from Short Cross Gin from Cross Guard, uh, where Chris is from over there. And there's an envelope on your chair or beside your chair. Uh, I would love it. All right, you're not obliged. I totally appreciate that everyone does charity stuff. Everyone has their own stuff going on. Uh, if you feel that you have had uh, any enjoyment from tonight, uh, you've enjoyed the speakers, and you have another fantastic speaker still to go. If you've enjoyed the speakers, enjoyed the, the invitation, and the sandwiches were amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> uh, I would encourage you to stick a few quid in that envelope, write your name on it. If you haven't got any money, uh, stick your business card in it, and I'll get back to you for a few quid. Uh, if you want to write a check, stick it in there, that's fine as well. Whatever, I'll take whatever. And every single penny that you give me tonight, I will spend in the North Nation Belarus between the 1st and the 7th of January next year. Uh, we will do a little draw for a bottle of short cross gin. Uh, I hope you have a great evening. One thing I would like to say, which I haven't done, uh, the reason we're here, Mark, is because you and Michelle have been in business for 10 years. And I would like to have a lot of you. That was a round of applause for Michelle. That was well done. That was a valid effort. A valid effort. Uh, I'm going to joke. Folks, listen, thank you very much. We're going to have a little uh, recess. Yeah. I'll hand over to Ross now. Uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> Folks, so we're going to have a little short comfort break now. There is refreshments out the back behind the curtain. Uh, we're going to come back in sort of 10 minutes or so, but you'll hear me heard news all through. So feel free.
Just to repeat that, guys, any more envelopes for the raffle, please feel free, Mr. Campbell, drop them in the envelope box in the front of the room. Please, can we have them in the front of the room? Thank you very much. Fantastic, I think we're all here. Oh, one more. Yeah, keep it coming. Any more? Yeah, one more. Oh, it's always one. Come on, Cam. <laughs> yeah. Turn them upside down. Thank you very much. This is great, Kevin. Why just stand here for another 10 minutes? Just keep asking any more. Okay, folks, thank you very much for coming back so promptly. That was great. Um, we're on to our final speaker of the evening now. Um, this is a chap that I've met approximately five years ago. I don't know if you'll remember this or not, Andy. Um, it was <laughs> at a, one of those forced networking events up in the northwest. It was speed networking, where somebody vomited information onto you for 60 seconds and expected you to retort in the same fashion. Uh, everybody was playing by the rules until Andy and I sat down together and then just decided to have a chat for two minutes really because we were fed up with it all. Um, but that struck a chord with me because he did speak to me human to human as has been spoken today and there was, a, there was a bond built through there. We've crossed paths throughout the years here and there and, and across and we've seen each other at events and nodded and smiled and waved. Um, but it was recently where I hooked up with um, Andy again with, through Wi-Fi Refugees, one of the charity events that he runs. That he's put me on a path and he's opened a door that just can't be shut now. Um, he was able to introduce me to a few folks who have helped me professionally. He's able to give me guidance and things of the way should be done. And on a personal level now, I'm taking on things that I've never, ever even thought of previously. So, without me rambling on anymore, final speaker of the day, Andy Jarvis. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, You'll see I'm quite professional this evening. I'm, my notes are over there, so I had to write a few things down on the plate just to make sure that uh, I, I knew what I was going to do. And if I'd have known what was going to be in the other speakers' presentations, I might have done something entirely different. Kyle uh, kind of sunk me earlier on. I tend to present like this with my top button fastened up, and it's all part of the brand. It's how you look. It's been a bit different. Unfortunately, I've got a little bit Christmassy a little bit early, so I am going to have to pop the top button this evening, otherwise I'm going to choke myself. Um, but that's all right. So, there's a clicker. We're here to talk about small business marketing. I know uh, people have covered different things in different parts of the subject, so I thought I'd... Um, oh, oh, it's time for clock. It's time for clock. Why is up here? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so, so here, let's, not, let's talk about small business marketing, but as it's all about storytelling, you've got to start with the story you know best, and the, my favourite subject to talk about is me. So, we'll start there. Um, 
As Ross said, I he didn't mention I run a company called XMO Marketing. I focus on marketing strategy. I believe success in your business starts with strategy, and that's where I start with. So I don't jump in right at the end of let's do Facebook, let's do Twitter. Start at the beginning, get the strategy in place, and then move on from there. I also run a thing called Wi-Fi Refugees. If you haven't um, been bombarded by a lot on social media, I've missed a trick. But what Wi-Fi Refugees is basically is marketers giving up two hours of their time once a month if for small businesses, companies that can't usually tap in to marketing agency services to go and spend 20 minutes getting advice from professional marketing experts um, or me. And for that, they, uh, they donate £10, which then goes to a refugee charity here in Belfast helping refugees settle in. So there's a couple of faces I recognise who've been to see me at Wi-Fi Refugees. Ross is one of them, Frank's another. And since then, we've grown a team of, oh, what is it, about 12, 13 of us now, maybe 14, uh, who are trying to expand. We've hit a few bumps along the way, and we're not doing anything in December, although that's by design. We've got a big launch plan for January, February, March, where we're going to be launching six, maybe seven venues across Northern Ireland, um, with dates all the way through to April, possibly a big GDPR, uh, focused Wi-Fi refugees conference for small businesses. So there's lots of exciting things happening there. It's all about giving back, connecting people, the things Martin talked about. And that's not there from some cynical business ploy to try and make XMO look better. I started that in my last agency at the Tomorrow Lab, and I did it because it felt like it was the right thing to do. Like it was a good thing to do. I love working with small businesses. Small businesses don't often have bags of cash. So you can either worry about that, or you can say, let's just do something and then try and get something back out of that. So that, that's why the Wi-Fi refugees. And I studied at the University of Ulster, so now I'm gonna give you a 50, 17 minutes and 30 seconds academic presentation about the theory of marketing. <laughs> I hope you're all ready. Um, I should say as well, while we're going along, please do tweet, I don't think this has been hammered home enough by the, um, by the MC, sorry. Um, hashtag for tonight is MM3. That comes from Micro Marketing 3 Perspectives. Uh, I'm the third. So if you do, please do tweet me, because I'm a twat. No, that doesn't work, does it? I mean, yeah, please do tweet me as the presentation goes on, at Andy Jarvis or at XMO Marketing. So, right, this is what I need for. Um, I want everyone to stand up, please. I'm not going to get to hold hands. Kevin's already done that one. I don't want you to get to sit down really quickly in this. So, <coughs> if you don't run a small business, and define that in any way you like, but if you don't run a small business, sit down. And if you're here, if you're not here to find out more about marketing, if you're just here maybe to support Martin and Michelle because you think it's nice to do, or you heard there was free sandwiches, you can sit down as well, please. That's all right, and you know, there's no fingers being pointed or anything like that. Um, and who here thinks they don't know anything about marketing? If you think you do know something about marketing, sit down. So we've got a few folks left standing, that's okay. That's okay. Right. So I'm just trying to look who's looking the least. There's a couple of nervous looking people around here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. What well, I'm going to say, hey, what's your name, sir? With a glass of milk? Dermot. Dermot. Brilliant. Dermot, just remember your own name. Everyone else can sit down, Dermot. You can sit down as well. Remember your name. We might be coming back to you later on. Thank you very much, Dermot. Anyway, right. So, small business marketing. When you talk to small businesses, whether that's in Wi Fi refugees or in Eximo marketing, what is the most common thing I say to them? What do you know about marketing? What's the most common answer that you get back from people who run small businesses? Nothing. There we go. Who said that? Uh, nothing. Yeah, so what do you know about Nothing. The sadly depressing, repetitive, I don't know anything about marketing. And do you know what? It's not true. You do. People who run small businesses know more about marketing than almost any other bunch of people you'll ever meet. They know more about marketing than most people in marketing jobs in most places. Honestly, it's true. But there's a reason why you think you don't know anything about marketing. And that's because you don't actually know what marketing is. You'll have to stick with me on this, it's getting a bit simple. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you think marketing is? Shout out a few things that you think might, you can be quiet because I know you can yeah. But shout out, what do you think marketing is? And I don't want an academic description, but someone, come on, what do you think marketing is or what's it involved for? Marketing sales, then you, No one shouts and then you all shout at once. You say you said promotion. Great. And promoting, promoting products and services, the one over here said? Helping sell stuff. Helping sell stuff, yeah. It's all of these things. Anything else? Any other? Telling stories. Telling stories, creating demand. I, create, I like creating demand. 
Creating a brand, yeah. It's all of these things. Educating and it, the public. Educating the public, yeah, the brand awareness and bringing all that in. So it's all of these things. And you start to look at marketing, and you start to hear people jump on stage and tell you marketing is this really complex discipline. And look at there are complex things about marketing. But I'm going to try and simplify the basics of it so you start to think, actually, I do know what I'm talking about here. So th there's many different definitions of marketing. But one of the easy places to start is like, what does marketing encompass? And for me, it encompasses these four things. And it covers these, and these have been in marketing theory for a long, long time. You've probably all had these beaten into you at school or maybe at university. There'll be someone sat there nudging the person next to them and going, there's actually seven Ps of marketing now. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two things I'll say for that. One, I have the microphone. <laughs> and two, look, the bits of theory that I put out there originally, um, four Ps of marketing, Ada, Porter's Five Forces, some of you may have heard of these, some of you might not, not have heard of them. But they're out there to be challenged. But what still holds true is the central things that people talked about in marketing in the 50s and a bit earlier, these things, are still true to them. Some people might say, okay, you add on, what about process, what about people? These are all important, but I'm yet to see anything that tells me that this still doesn't work. But marketing's changed, these, you know, now with digital marketing's changed. Bullshit. Marketing's still broadly about the same things. So, small business owner, do you know what product you sell? Do you? Most well, small business owners, do you know what products you sell? I'm damn sure you do, okay? Do you know why people buy certain products as well? I'm pretty sure you do that as well. What about the price? Who sets the price in a small business? A small business owner. But that's not marketing. No, no, that's not marketing. It really is. If you get the pricing wrong, is anyone going to buy it? It's almost like promotions marketing. It is, it's up there. But if you can promote the hell out of it. But if you're trying to sell clickers for 5,000 quid, you're not going to sell any. I ran a course the other week and I charged uh, the exorbitant fee of £650 for the course. Uh, you got to spend two days with me. I mean, I thought it was a bargain. <laughs> but I got two bits of feedback. One, an email from someone said, looks a bit cheap, not sure there's going to be any value in it. And another email that said, far too expensive for what you're charging. Mm -hmm. Pricing is probably, for me, the most difficult part of running a small business. It is horrific to try and set a price. And everyone has a piece of advice for you. Just push that up a bit, push it down a bit. Why don't you sell three for two? Why don't you do this? Why don't... And I can't tell you what the right thing to do is. Not today, not, not here to all of you. It's just about making sure you do what you think is right for the business. And then you get to promotion. And this is often when people think about marketing, this is what they think marketing is. The promoting of products and services to the, the market. And this is a fundamental part of marketing, but it's not the only part. So when I talk to small business owners and they go, I don't know anything about marketing. I go, you do? You just maybe don't know a huge amount about this bit. But don't let them that underestimate, because I'm going to show you a few things now that will help you start to put promotion into perspective. There are technical aspects to this, and I'm not going to dig into all the technical aspects tonight. But if you get the basics right, the next bits are really quite easy. And they're really quite easy because the companies that are trying to sell you those services make it really easy to give them money. You're thinking people like Facebook and Google. So, right. So back to some boring academic stuff. Uh, this is a process I built with a guy called Niall at the Tomorrow Lab to help try and analyze how you do your promotion. Now we worked for an agency, I still do. So this was a way of finding all the information out so that we could help put the steps in place. And the seven steps, and you'll see they all begin with C, so we called it the seven C's model. What one, you know, you all got that, that, right? Company customer, competition context, competence and content, and capital. The group together in twos, obviously other than capital, because they kind of sit together. And when you think about promotion, I like to where I'll spend the next time, the next little bit of time is here, talking about company and customer. Because for me, if you can get this bit right, what do you do as a company and who do you do it for? That becomes really, really easy to then start to put in place all the other bits of your marketing strategy. Should I be on Facebook? What about Snapchat? What if I, should I advertise in this newspaper? What do you do? Who do you do it for? Do the people you do it for, will they see it in that channel? Yeah, okay, right, we'll give it somewhere to look. So, Dermot, we're back to you. Come on up, Dermot. Let's give a round of applause to Dermot. Uh, two easy questions. What do you do as a business? Photographer. And who do you do it for? Me. 
<laughs> all right then, smart That's all right, we'll, we'll break this down then, come on, we've got a fight in today. Right. As a company, you, do, you take photographs, that's brilliant. Yep. You're a photographer. Yes. Brilliant. Why should I use you and not that man there with the camera? Because I'm great. Excellent. I like that, because I'm great. It's very <laughs> un-Northern Irish answer, you don't get that around here. Yeah. Why should I use him? I'm all right, well, he's quite good as well too, but you know. Just about the last 10 years in history, yes, that's probably why. Yeah, that's great. Right. <laughs> God bless you. Right, so <laughs> what, what, what sort of photography do you do? Uh, a little bit of everything, mostly commercial stuff around food photography and uh, sort of PR work. Excellent. So food photography, PR work. Yeah. So you'll do a bit of all sorts, but that's your speciality. Yes. Excellent. And as a business, why so? Come on, why should I use you? How long have you been a photographer? Tell us that sort of information. Uh, two weeks. I've been a business here. Now, though, so. <laughs> How long have you been taking pictures? Though, come on. Uh, probably since I was about ten or eleven. So. Most of and as a business? Just uh, four years in Australia and then now a couple of weeks back here. So. Gotcha. So you're Australia's best photographer? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Internationally renowned. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your mind. So we'll stay there, don't go anywhere. Right. So when we talk about what you do, one thing that I often talk to clients about is do you have a mission statement? Have you got a mission statement? I want to help others, help others to be successful by telling their story. He's got a mission statement. <laughs> <laughs> so give us that again. I want others to help others to be successful by telling their story. Brilliant. Does anyone hear the word photographs in that mission statement? And it's brilliant because of it. It's about <laughs> storytelling. It's like you this up here, you, well, everyone else can see, not you. This is what happens when you talk to people about mission statements. This type of shite gets wheeled out everywhere. <laughs> it has been, mission statements have been destroyed by consultants. And, um, don't look at me like that, it's fine. Uh, mission statements have been destroyed by consultants into long-winded, vague things like this. Um, I, I, I use this all the time and I absolutely love it. So what happens is, you end up with these mission statements that nobody can remember. Who works for a big company? There's not many here, it's a small business, but I can invent, isn't it? So we've got a couple of people sticking on with that. Can you remember your mission statement? No. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even want to have a stab at it, would you? Yeah, they, but it'll be something like, you know, I'm trying to deliver the best possible something for these people at the greatest price possible and be the best in Northern Ireland and Ireland and Europe, delivering worldwide global services to us, something or other. And nobody can remember it. But if you've got a mission statement that's really tight and really simple and punchy and memorable, and when you start saying when Kyle was saying, what are you just retweeting all this crap on social media for? When I was at the Tomorrow Lab, we used to have a mission statement that was connecting business to consumers online. We got work experience students in, and I would say to them, we would say, right, okay, I need you to get some social media content. So, well, what do you want us to get? So, anything that talks about connecting businesses to consumers online. And inevitably, they'd go off, spend a couple of hours, is that it? Oh, yeah, that's it, come and do it. And they would come back, and we'd use 80 to 90% of the stories they would find. So yes, we did retweet all the crap from other people, but it was all connected to our mission statement. So it's not just about photography, it's about telling people stories, and that's what you do, and that's the essence of what you do. So who do you do it for? You said you do it for, oh, yeah. there. Who do you do it for? Who are your customers? And, go on, go on. who do you do it for? Any small business. Where? I did stand up and say I didn't know that. <laughs> Often, one of the questions, one of the answers you get here with people is, who do you do it for? And the most popular answer is? Everyone. Yay! And then John Luke comes back again. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is not your customer. Now, um, so what sort of small businesses? Uh, predominantly, I guess, restaurants and people who do food, because we get a lot of food photography. Now we get in there. Brilliant. What about, are you working for them in Sydney? Uh, uh, I still do some work for... Shot myself in the foot with a crap question. What about it? Where did you live? Bali. Thailand. Bali. Did you, did you go no, to Thailand? No, no, no. Right. Okay. So it's not just small businesses. And it's small businesses where? Predominantly Northern Ireland. Predominantly Northern Ireland. In what sectors? In food, mostly food. Right. There you go. So we're starting to get it down to you help businesses tell stories. Then what sort of businesses? Small food businesses based in Northern Ireland. Right. Sure. So if you've got that, if you know that's what you do, and that's who you do it for, then the bit in the middle is just all you need to do is tell that story to those people. And that is pretty much marketing. If you've got that, this is what I do, and that's who I do it for, you just need to find the bit in the gap, and that's the promotion bit in the middle. Sure. 
Now that's where it gets a little bit more complex. But actually, most small business owners, if I could, let's give them a round of applause anyway. So Most small business owners can get to that important bit. What is it I do? And don't just start, when you say stuff, I just take photographs. Yeah, I just take photographs on my iPhone in my pocket. I probably are taking photographs off my pocket. In fact, um, everyone just stand here, give us a big smile, and take a picture while we're here. It's a marketing event, right? You've got to do a selfie on the stage, okay? Uh, everyone give us a big smile. One, two, three. I'll give us a wave as well, you miserable <laughs> sons. So you have to start to dig into the, what you do. There's a, a TED talk by Simon Sinek, or Simon Sinek, depends on how you want to pronounce his name. Start with why. Why do you do it? What do you Get into those interesting bits. Just taking photographs. I've seen loads of people just taking photographs. But that's it. when you have a mission statement. And you don't have to call it a mission statement. It could be a vision. It could be whatever else you want to call it. But have something that tells people what you do. For me, I said it right at the beginning. XML marketing. Success starts with strategy. That's my mission statement. People say, oh, is that not a strap line? Mission statement, strap lines. I mean, strap lines tend to be, marketing lines tend to be a little bit more short term as opposed to long term. But success starts with strategy. That's going to stay, I, that's what I do, marketing strategy. We talked about customers, just about identifying your ideal customer. What do they look like? What problems do they have? When you start talking about restaurant owners in Northern Ireland, what problems do they have? It's different to restaurant owners in London. Restaurant owners in London tend to have busy trade most days a week. Restaurant owners in Northern Ireland tend to be busy, what, two nights a week maybe? Three at a push sometimes? Different problems here, so the context is different. So start to understand who your, who your target customer is and what problems you solve for them. But then we're back to the triangle, and I said I was going to talk about company and customer. I could talk about all seven, but the, the shot clock is uh, counting down quite quickly. So the other one I just want to talk about briefly is the one that's right at the top which is capital. So, yes, it's all right saying this is what I do as a company and this is who I do it for, but there is an important element to it at the top, which is all about the fact that a small business is, as Martin alluded to, just because it keeps Martin in business, is you have to make it about the money. What's it worth to you? Because if you're not trying to find out how it pays back for you as a business, you're not going to be in business very long. As a small business owner myself now, I'm starting to find this out really, really quickly that it's all right doing great things, but if you don't pay, then you're not going to do many great things anymore. So, when you're measuring digital marketing, or when you're measuring your marketing, always start with what are your key business objectives. If you start by measuring campaign level objectives, oh, I've got so many likes on that post on Facebook, oh, that one got retweeted six times. What's that worth to your business? I'm still trying to find a business who can identify the pound value of one like. If you are that business, please come and see me afterwards. I will love you forever and you will be my next case study. I don't think that business exists. It has to be about the Benjamins, if I'm street enough to say that. It's Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> um, it has to be about, how, about what's your business objective? For me, I'm trying to, I know what my, as a small business owner, I know what I need to make every month to cover the bills, to keep the lights on, to stop me having to eat beans on toast. I know how many clients that means I have to work with. I'm now trying to work out the rest of those metrics. To work with the right number of clients, how many conversations do I need to have to make that into to business? And from there, so how many conversations do I need to have? Okay, how many networking events do I need to attend? Right, okay. What do I need to tweet about and put on Facebook and put on other social media that's going to introduce me to those conversations? And then I might get back to, okay, so if I get a post retweeted a lot because I'm at an event, will that get me into more of those conversations? And that's when you start looking at what the social metrics are or, you know, your, your uh, click-through rates and things like that. But you have to start off with, what's this worth to my business? What's my business objective? And it's not always, it's not always about money. Sometimes it can be about how many leads or how many appointments and there's different metrics for different businesses. Um, for me, I know what my metrics are. I think I talked to Martin once about what he measures in his business. I think he counts his money in tens of thousands, but you know what it's like <laughs> counts. But you know, so they have different metrics and a bigger abacus, but it's pretty much the same thing. But for me, it's about understanding the key metrics in your business. Small business owners are brilliant at this because you know that if you don't hit that figure by the end of the month, bad things happen. When you start to talk to bigger businesses and marketers who don't necessarily see budgets and don't see this and the other, it becomes a bit more problematic. So understand what your key metrics are, which is a lot of the time in small businesses, what do you need to keep the lights on and work backwards from there. Don't start with how many likes did I get and work up from there because that, that's the wrong way around to do it. 
So listen, I could talk uh, literally, as most people in this room now know, for another an hour or two on this subject. Um, but please, in fact, I've got one more slide just to show you, because I, I really am keen to show you this one. I am over time, but I'm going to go for it anyway. Um, there is one thing with small business owners and marketing. Every small business owner tells me, I don't know about anything about marketing. The second most common answer I get from them is, I don't have time to do marketing. That's the two things all small business owners tell me. And I always show them that picture. <laughs> I have got two small business owners, and I am now guilty of this. I genuinely am guilty of this. This can be where a lot of small business owners manage their social media. <laughs> and you're laughing, but you're all nodding, right? <laughs> and this is where, if I was from the south of England, I'd say it's on the Kazi. Right. Take, the, some more, take social media, take marketing out of that sentence, and drop in the word accounts. If you manage people, take marketing out of that sentence, and drop in the word human resources. Words. Right? and see how ludicrous that sentence sounds. I mean, it sounds daft enough saying, oh, I manage my social media on the toilet. But add in that and say, I do all my accounts on the toilet. I manage my staff on the toilet. It's nonsense, you wouldn't ever do it. So before you start telling me, oh, marketing doesn't work, TV advertising doesn't work, Facebook doesn't work, oh, all these things don't work. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg's worth 60 billion quid, Facebook doesn't work, it does. But if this is the attention you're giving it, it's not going to work for you. Because you can't just give it this five minutes or ten minutes or maybe even twenty minutes for some people <laughs> attention and hope that it's going to work because it's not going to work. And what I would say, the word decide, uh, the English word decide, comes from the Latin word, the suffix side means to kill. Right? Regicide, pesticide, homicide, decide. It's not deciding, it's not about what you're going to do, it's about what you're not going to do. What are you going to kill in your business to give yourself time, give yourself time to manage your marketing properly, to manage your social media properly, to make sure it's going to work for you? Because if you're going to do it on the Kazi, it's not going to work for you. Well, that's me. I'll leave you with a picture of a toilet. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andy. That was great. Um, can I maybe just invite all the speakers back up onto the stage and have a little seat? We're going to go for a short Q&A session. And Joe's going to take over. He's got some questions tweeted through there. Do you see No, no. no. myself first. I'm Jill Rourke. Um, like everybody on the panel, um, Martin approached me to see if I would be willing to take part in this. Um, probably different from everyone on the panel. Um, I obviously tell my own story, but for a living, I tell other people's stories. I'm a copywriter. Um, so that's part of what I do. I have to get into your minds and into your brand and into your business and see what's worth drawing out. And Everybody, I meet two, two types of people. People who think, oh, I, have, I don't have a story. I have nothing worth telling. Nobody's going to be interested in what I have to say. Or I have people who think that absolutely everything is interesting. <laughs> and it's my job to kind of pick through that and, and see what their ideal customers. Andy talked a lot about ideal customers. And that is the key. You're writing your story to them. Because when they read your content and your copy and your tweets and your social media, all of that thing, they need to recognize themselves in your writing. And they need to have that, you know that freaky look that you have on your face, the little sideways glance where you think, are they in the room with me? Do they, how did they get into my head? You need to be able to understand and inhabit their space and, and tell that to everyone. So that's, that's, that's what you have to do. And when you talk about one-liners or mission statements, and it's all pithy, witty, cryptic stuff that is bullshit and it doesn't really mean anything, um, yes, that's definitely true, but you as yourself need to have a one-liner in your head because you need to be able to quickly tell someone 
exactly what it is you do, who you help, how you help, and be able to, to communicate that to someone. That's, that's about branding, that's about storytelling. So we've had lots of questions tonight about that and how we can do that. And a lot of you know Martin um, for your sins. Um, and so I'm going to jump the queue here because it's usually Martin's role to ask the first question <laughs> at any event. So and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to pretend to be Martin here and I'm going to ask him the first question. And the first question for Martin is, he's been in business 10 years, Michelle and Martin have been in business 10 years and Martin would very modestly say that all he does is carry Michelle's handbag, which he does do, um, but um, we all know that Martin is an absolute master at connecting people and what I would like to know is that when you first started out, you in your talk at the beginning you said that small business owners are our heroes, they are our brightest lights and our shining stars. Why did you go into business yourself, what, what, was it, what was in your story that made you decide to strike it out on your own? Okay. Michelle and I both came from large corporate organizations, so Michelle had trained with KPMG and had worked her way up to be a small business manager. My background was legal and I had worked with large legal corporate practices in the accounting function. Um, and it was a great environment to work. It was challenging, it was rewarding, it was, you had all the resources that I talked about that you get in employment, but what we didn't get was that satisfaction of building the relationships. And relationships are where the, the joy comes from, yeah. you know, where you get that from. And also, it was that sense that we weren't doing as much as we could do for the clients that we were working with. So everything was scheduled down to six minute time slots. And you know, your client came in and you had spoken about what they're doing, they were spawning around and buzzed out the door again, they probably what happened there? And then it got a big bill for it. What we wanted to do was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what we wanted to do was to give the clients the confidence to be able to speak to us without having to worry about clock ticking. And we weren't going to be able to do that with the traditional model. So what we did was we set up a livelihood. I called it a cottage industry for a modern age, where we were using cutting edge technology, but dealing with people in a traditional and a, a, a social and a, and, a, and a more appropriate sort of way. And also, you know, we actually like each other. And we weren't seeing as much of each other as we wanted in our corporate lifestyles. So it was great to be able to um, work together on a day-to-day -day basis. And we could both do completely different things. We thought we were sitting on each other's laps all day. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and now I'm going to take the question from me. Ross, could you deliver the mic? Yes, certainly. So that little exercise we did at the start was to shake your hands. My tip would be to shake more hands, uh, to be, well, so I'm going to stand off this and uh, some of the shepherds correct me when, when they need to. Uh, I, I coach and, and mentor people now and if I was to say anything, and this is just, this is in small business, uh, whether you're an accountant or, or a retailer or, or Whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, you can do it online, and this takes in marketing, and this takes in, it takes in uh, copywriting, and, and uh, telling your story. If you can be your true, authentic self, always, then what you allow people to do is be their true, authentic self. And if you want to make a connection with someone, if you want to make a superficial connection, be whoever you want. Uh, but if you want to make a true, deep, lasting, loving, uh, working uh, connection and a relationship with someone, then be your true, authentic self. 
be who you are, be honest, be open, say no, if no is the thing to say, uh, say yes when it's the thing to say, and just be genuine. And I think if you can be genuine, you'll go an awful long way. I hope that answers your question, David. So I'm a firm believer in the karma, the law of attraction, what goes around, goes around, whatever you want to call it. And like my values is pen it forward. So you know, when I, whenever I started off in business, I didn't really know what I was doing. I still don't. Um, but a lot of people helped me and a lot of people had coffees with me and gave me advice and mentored me. And I think it's important that whenever you're on your journey, that you pay that forward to other people, you mentor other people. Um, whether that means like getting involved with schools and giving talks or whatever it is, or just meeting people who are starting off um, and giving them a bit of advice and, and help the way that you know, a lot of people will probably help you get to where you are today. So, paying it forward. Yeah, I feel under pressure to stand up now. I've started <laughs> early. Um, I, when I started as part of the company bit, I sort of said it was just mission statements, but there is pillars beneath that, the values are some of the things, it was only 20 minutes so I couldn't do the whole shebang. Uh, for like my, my daughter's school has a, a, a strap line, a mission statement, whatever you call it, which is we care, we share, we learn together. And I was really, really close to pinching that because I just thought it kind of, you know, it, it's like, yeah, I, you know, I do. You know, it, it's about, I care about my clients. I think it's the only way I'm ever going to grow as a business is by giving a shit about the people I work with and, and trying to make it better. We share, I try and give back with Wi-Fi refugees and things like that, and then we learn together. I go to a lot of events. I am quite happy to tell anyone, um, turn the camera off, quick, um, that I don't know everything. Um, I know it's hard to believe, but I genuinely don't know everything. So um, I, I thought that really worked, but I, it just felt like I'd be nicking a primary school's mission statement, so I decided to move on from that. So the, the answer I tend to go with is um, authenticity um, and fun, which I put together, and I think there's a big difference between fun and funny. 
Um, and while I do try and be funny when I'm presenting, um, occasionally, sometimes, I think when you're dealing with people's livelihood, you don't want to try and be funny, it's not that. But I think you can try and be fun and enjoy what you're doing. Um, so I think there is a big difference between fun and funny. Um, honesty and integrity. If I think what you're doing or what you're, you're asking me to do um, doesn't work, or if I think your product or your service is shit, I'll happily tell you that. Not happily, but I will tell you that. I'm not going to take your money off you for six months and then have that. The, the worst conversations as a marketing agency or freelancer is where you sit down in front of a client after six months and you know they're going to shoot you. Uh, not, you sort of not actually shoot you, but you know that you're, gonna, you're getting sacked that day. You know they're not going to work. And they're awful conversations to have. And every time I've been ditched by a client, I go back to the beginning and, and think, do you know what, I knew right at the beginning I shouldn't have taken that job on. And everyone who works in this side of marketing will get to the end and go, I knew I shouldn't have taken that on. But you take it on because maybe the money was good, or you take it on because someone else in the business thought you should do it. But actually, if you go back and say, look, if I'd have had that honesty and that integrity, they'd say, look, I'm sorry, this just doesn't work for me, you'd have missed out on that awful conversation. And they're bloody horrible to have, aren't they? They're awful. And you know, you get sacked occasionally. So yeah, I'm, my aim is never to get sacked because I'll be honest. And, open and all that stuff. Won't happen, by the way. <laughs> it's my morning, and I'll sit in my window. <laughs> and the... <laughs> I'm a bit knackered, to be honest, but... Um, the most important word for me is trust. Every single one of our clients that comes to us trusts us. Trusts our confidentiality, trusts our professionalism, trusts us to do the job that we should be doing when they maybe don't know what it is we're doing when we take their books away. They trust us. And we have to live up to that trust. And the way we live up to that trust is by genuinely being on the side of the client. We have got our clients back because we care about them. We build personal relationships that mean something to us so that we care about our client, and that means that we go out and we fight our battles for them, whether it be with HMRC or with whatever. We're there genuinely caring about it. So trust is the word. Run, Ross, run, run. James Perry, James Perry Exam Coaching, and I excel at delivering the next, uh, next generation for the seniors. I'm going to start shopping at home. And really, all I want to say is just comments rather than questions. And first of all, it's an exceptional night, so thank you for everybody in the presentations. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> the next bit that struck home, and it's actually the cow, the cow, the cow, the cow, the is to try and break out your stereotype. Now, I am a chartered accountant, and I apologise to all the friends in the room. I am not the stereotypical accountant. Far from it. I'm actually going to break through that stereotype. It took me 35 years to reach that, you realise that. And the way the lifestyle that you're doing now, I will be doing that. So mm -hmm. thanks for that inspiration. The next point, though, is thank you very much, Mark, for mentioning me in your presentation. And my comment really is this is that the person that I was dealing with, whenever I asked you to, do a presentation mind at the event, and you told me how nervous you were, how you were, you actually were sweating at one point, you had notes in your pocket, you stood out and presented. Looking at you now presenting is an unbelievable difference. Where you hold yourself, your delivery, your body language, and your tone is absolutely spot on tonight. So I just really want to say that. that was okay. Fine on, thanks for that. Thank thanks for tonight. <coughs> Good evening, I'm uh, Rod Zapian and I do audiovisual production. Uh, I just recently started uh, my business, it's very, very small, smaller than you'd think. So, uh, as a foreigner, what kind of advice would you, would any of you give me? And thank you for your speeches, they were all wonderful. Good evening, I'll kick out foreign of these ones as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> As, um, as a foreigner to these shows, <laughs> I, I think it's 
it's been touched on a couple of times, certainly networking, it's where I get the bulk of my business from, is going around, shaking hands, talking to people, drinking coffee. My caffeine intake is dangerously high, but that, that's all part of the, uh, of the business process. Northern, and no one throw anything at me, Northern Ireland isn't like many other places. Um, <laughs> that is a good thing and also it has its challenges sometimes as well. You know, don't be afraid to talk to people and get different viewpoints on it. And there's lots of things that people in Northern Ireland don't like to talk about. You know, there's words you're not allowed to say. Ask them questions about it because you can. And it really helps you understand the psyche of what's going on in the place. So, um, you know, just get to as many things as you can. Meet as many people as you can. Um, just follow Martin on Twitter. And just He's never ever not at an event, so just forever he's going, <laughs> just go around, you know. He says he likes Michelle and he likes spending time with her, but he's never there, he's always at the event. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just get to as many places as you can, meet as many people as you can, and just make sure the work's good, because if the work's good, it'll follow. Uh, I'm minded of a, a guy that I watched on, where do these things come from, I don't know. Uh, I'm minded of a guy that I watched on Newsnight one night, and the, the the, the thing on Newsnight was about uh, people relating to other people, okay, and, and people, uh, the, the question, the two questions asked to people, would you, as in this person, would you help someone in need? And nearly everybody, I think out of a thousand people, 988 said, yes, I would help someone in need. And they asked, of the same person, they said, do you think other people would help someone in need? And the vast majority of people said, no, they wouldn't. Now that's an oxymoron. You can't have everyone saying that I would help someone and that everyone else wouldn't. Those sums don't add up. And the point I'm making is just ask for some help. We're all lovely, attractive, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. There's another stat I'll leave you with. Just, just for that. So just ask, just ask for some help. Just reach out, you know, put your hand up. I need some help here. You know, talk to people in, in Catholics and pubs and, and things like this, connect with people. Um, we love to talk, as you already have worked out, and we will. Uh, another step uh, is that uh, one in three people are exceptionally sexy, uh, really talented, and really intelligent. Right. So, if you look to the person you're left, <laughs> <laughs> and if you look to the person on your right, you think, no. so that means it must be you. <laughs> <laughs> so, just go out there and, uh, seriously, I get a round of applause. <laughs> uh, the point I'm making is, the point I'm making is, is stand up, ask for help, speak to people, uh, go out, network, you know, follow guys, we've all said it, uh, just make your presence felt. Don't be afraid, fill your, fill your skin, fill the room, you know, go out and, and, and meet people and you will get the help. And in addition to going to events and networking, like something that's really helped me when I was traveling is joining co-working spaces. Um, so you see there's one right here. Um, I don't know if I can put it with them, trying to do the promotion or anything here. Um, but you know, I find a lot of value in going to co-working spaces, meeting people, just having conversations. And like, a lot of the conversations I've had in the last year around the world, going to places have been, you know, had a big impact on me. And like, I've learned a lot from doing that. So. That is a really good place to start, plus going to events and meeting people. And sometimes just emailing people in the community and asking them to meet you for coffee and um, making those connections or just asking people to help you over coffee. Have you ever had anyone refuse to meet you for a coffee? I can't think of one time when anyone said, no, I'm not on me. Once. Once. <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> We see, we're privileged, parents are privileged in that we get to see into the personal workings of many, many businesses. And we have 300 clients, and we've had them for 10 years, and we've been working on the parents for many more years than that. So we get the privilege of seeing what works and what doesn't. And one of the most important things that you can do, no matter what your background or what you do as a small business owner, is keep it simple. Because everything gets complicated really quickly. When I was talking about how your employment, everything's done around you. You might have a team, you might have somebody looking for the work, you might have somebody doing the credit control. Guess who does open yourself out? You do. So find a way to identify the easiest possible way to make the money that you make the money and do that 
until you've got time or space to do more stuff and grow it out that way. Now that, that's my view, other people would look at it a different way, but the successful people that I see that are happy doing what they do, like me and Michelle and the guys sitting here, are guys that start off by identifying the simplest possible way to do what they do, whether it's in their accounting or their uh, marketing or their whatever, to so find the simplest route and just do that until you answer something. As a foreigner here, don't don't hide behind that. Don't and, and don't hide it. Um, be honest. Be yourself. Um, a few years ago, as we chatted earlier with, with you and Esther, um, I'm a copywriter and did translation for a long time too. And at the start of my business, I was so I worked with lots of other people and provided lots of other services. I didn't keep it simple, um, and I also hid behind. We do this. We can offer this. Our business does this. And then about a year and a half ago, I thought, uh, no, I do all of that. I'm proud of doing all that. So I went through my website and I systematically changed everything that was we to I. Um, and I made it about me and make it about your story. When you're doing a good job, make sure that everybody knows about it and write it from your perspective. We talked about storytelling and your brand. Your brand is you. And if that's just you on your own, that's totally fine, and take the credit for it, um, because what you do is, is amazing, and just make sure that people know about it. Another question. You've got a well trained job. You've got a well trained. Hello, my name is Mary Jane, I'm from the Hopper Logging Company. And um, just to follow up on that question, you were saying, find out what works and what doesn't work. I'd like to know what surprised you that really hasn't worked, that you thought should have, or conversely, what has worked and really surprised you? I think the thing that really surprised me is that I thought when I started a country business working on the cutting edge of technology, that technology would make everything work and it would make our practice more popular and it would make people come to us because they want to use a cutting edge technology practice. And that's not the case. Technology helps. What works is relationships. So if I, if I was to say anything, it's that. Don't worry about what the trend is or what's cool or whatever. You know when you're in your own self what your, what your business is. If the technology helps it, use it for that. But it's, that's what surprised me. Technology by itself wasn't the answer. It wasn't the panacea. I think the biggest surprise for me was the um, ridiculously high fees that the accountants charge. <laughs> <laughs> Typically, um, although it does seem to pay for lots of booze and sandwiches and, 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 and uh, biscuits and the like. So yeah, uh, and the big house and the holidays and the camper van. And the, anyway, um, <laughs> get on. Sorry. Um, um, what was the question? Um, no, I, I think. I'm still new. My, I only started out with my, um, I can't say anymore, my small business journey on the 1st of September and everything is surprising me at the minute and I mean that genuinely. I wake up some morning and say, what the bloody hell am I doing? So everything's still a bit of a surprise to me. Many of you are, are years in front of me and probably recognise that part of your journey. Um, I think the thing people talk to me about is we advertised on Facebook like we were told and it didn't work. Or we advertised on Google like we were told and it didn't work. And a lot of that tends to be just down to the planning and the execution of it rather than the platforms don't work and sometimes it's you and the way you've done it rather than the, the platform that doesn't work. But as I say, everything's a bit of a surprise to me at the minute. So, yeah. um, For me, it's probably the length of time that it takes to do things. Like when I started off, um, my expectations of what we would achieve in maybe the first year or the second year was like way off. And uh, just like we were saying, like, Whenever we like and started like playing around with like different marketing tools and Facebook it was like, yeah, we'll just like set this up, we'll we'll do it for five minutes on the toilet. And uh, but actually it takes a lot of time to learn those things, um, and to to get results out of it. I think anything that I've experimented with with in the business or any other projects that I've done, I think it's really easy to like underestimate the amount of time and effort and stress <coughs> that, that, that's required to get it going. Um, I think what has surprised me is interesting because it links the question that this gentleman asked about values. 
and it links the question that Damien asked, and it links the question that this chap here asked about help. And the thing that surprised me was when I have said that I can help people, thousands of people are wanting help. And the point I'm making is that there ain't no guru, gurus, you know, there ain't no you know, men or women that are that are sealed, you know. Everybody's just trying to build the future. That thing we're leaning into your future, you know, everyone's just trying to build their future in front of them. And I was amazed and surprised at the number of people that, that have asked me for help. I help people that, that earn 10 times what I earn, probably 20, 30 times what I earn. Uh, I help people in very high professional jobs, roles. Uh, and I also help people that are opening cafes and, and you know, doing, doing uh, things that aren't earning hundreds of thousands of pounds. So yeah, I think that the thing to do, the thing that surprised me is that, that everybody needs help. And uh, going backwards from that, if you ask for the help, somebody will recognize that and give it to you. Hope that answers your question. model, just keep asking why five times and you, and you get there. That, that's not a bad starting place. What we did with, with Dermot, where you start off, and, and it's easier to do it with someone else, when because talking to yourself, looking in the mirror, makes you feel a little bit like a serial killer, and it's quite difficult to do. But if you get someone else who has an understanding, if small business owners find it tough to, to access marketing support sometimes, big shout out to Wi-Fi refugees, if you come, 20 minute consultation, we can do this there. But uh, if you can find someone who has an understanding, someone in your network, someone you know who give you that half hour, give you that hour, and just get them and try and explain what you're doing and get them to keep asking why. Why? Why do you do it? Why do you do it? Yeah, you take photographs. You go, why? What sort of photographs do you take? How? And just keep trying to push to try and find that help because if you just stick at something quite simplistic, like, and I'm not picking on you, but like, I take photographs, that's fine, but you've just lumped yourself in with everyone who has a smartphone. So you need to get, you know, it's like, well, people say to me, oh, um, oh you, you're in marketing then. I said, oh, no. you know, I talk about success starts with strategy. And I try and get the conversation to talk about marketing strategy and how you build success into what you're doing by planning it properly. Because that, that's the bit that I do. And that's the value I add is getting that planning in place so you can execute it and understand how you measure it and how you see what you're doing and what's working and what's not. It's about putting the planning in place. But planning sounds a bit crap and a bit boring, doesn't it? And say, yeah, we plan. I know we write these grand plans. So talk about, you know, getting the success into your business. So it, it's tangible and maybe a bit emotional. It's like, oh right, okay, yeah, success. I want to be successful. But it starts with strategy. So you know that came with one tool I use. If you're trying to write the mission statement, or you're trying to come up with a line or something like that, just keep writing them. Just keep writing them. I think I wrote about thirty or maybe forty, and then kind of started going, that one's crap, that one's crap, that one's crap. Well, what about if I move that word here? And you start to narrow it down. You can pay highly priced consultants to, to come and do this with you. Uh, I'll be dishing out business cards at the end. I've got a bill to pay later. Uh, so, uh, but or you can just you know keep working it through yourself. But take the advantage, get the coffee, and talk to somebody. Once you get down to, if you're gonna take someone's time or you want to come to Wi-Fi refugees, if you just go, oh, what's my mission statement? It's gonna take forever. Do that little bit of work to narrow it a little bit and then go and start and asking someone. The questions and the backwards and forwards will really, really help you. Uh, one of the key things as well that I think is really useful is your value isn't just about metrics, it's also about how people feel. So sometimes the value that you can provide is the relief that someone would feel when it's taken off their plate or the time. 
behind the fight scene as well. So think about the emotions and, and, and how you make them feel. The next question is for Kyle. Um, and um, what you've told your story um, this evening and about your journey, but what has been the most important, I think it was Sharon online, um, can I ask what's the most important channel for your storytelling? Was it, was it the book? Was it Twitter? Was it a blog? What was it? Um, I mostly use a personal blog and Twitter. I was experimenting with YouTube videos, but my camera broke when I was away and I couldn't get it in place because of no fixed location. Um, but I, I, I find uh, the YouTube is actually really good. I've kind of found that Twitter has just become this stream of like incessant noise and people sharing other people's articles, whereas YouTube isn't like that. You know, you can't share other people's content on YouTube, but you can, but most of the people sharing stuff on YouTube when you're sitting in front of the camera and they're sharing authentic um, content and the barrier to entry to actually putting something on YouTube is much higher, so the quality generally seems to be better. So I personally would think that, or recommend that if you want to you know, tell your story, then doing it in front of the camera and putting it on YouTube is probably one of the most authentic ways and qu quite easy for people um, to digest. Like I spend most of my time when I'm on social media and I'm on YouTube um, consuming content rather than Twitter because it's so hard to find um, good quality content on there now. Any more questions in the audience? I'm going to hand back over to Ross and bring up Folks, I'm going to keep this very, very short and sweet. Thank you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for supporting everybody on the panel. Thank the panel and the, the guys for their speeches. It was terrific. Can we just put your hands together? <laughs>